In the Alaskan back channels, troopers hunt down a hostile fisherman. Hey! Hey! He almost center punched me. And take the dangerous game of cat and mouse to the skies. This is obviously not a safe situation. A lot of us would say this is what we signed up for. And deep in the Alaskan bush, an outgunned trooper, Bill Connors, battles an arsenal of illegal weapons on the streets. In the last seven days, I've had 17 rifles, shotguns, a machete, a crossbow. Yeah, it's quite a few. And in Fairbanks. Trooper Ryan Lott must track down a gunman hidden in the forest. This is Alaska State Troopers. It's summertime in Fairbanks, when days last almost 24 hours, and crime rates rise even at 1 a.m. We just got a 911. Somebody saying they heard multiple shots in the air and a lot of screaming. While dispatch was on 911, we also heard shots. 10-4, 19. They say it sound like someone in distress or? Unknown. Uh, Not really sure what's going on, but it could be potentially dangerous, so. We're going to treat it as the worst case scenario. Yes, also our complaint on 911 now just advises that you're going to be able to remain behind as well. So they head off. Yeah, I'm going to pop this rifle out in a minute, so. Yeah, so we're There's no sign of their suspect, but they do find his handiwork. Whoa, 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 whoa. Oh, and a shot in the mailbox. Yep. It's a round, looks like buckshot. Yeah, that's all buckshot is. It's one of his rounds. I don't know. Looks to me like he's shooting in the direction of the building. The second one. Hi, sir. State troopers. How many shots did you hear, you think, uh, total? at least a dozen. It was him yelling too? Yeah. Okay. But you didn't hear anyone else yelling, just, just him? No, that's what I'm saying. No one else was yelling back. Okay. Okay, hey, we'll check it out, man. Okay, good luck. Troopers fan out deeper into the densely forested neighborhood in search of the hidden gunman. Two cabins in the back, too. It's not a good feeling when you're not sure exactly where they are. You know, one of those rounds could shoot high, go through all the trees, maybe skip off the river and hit someone. So that's pretty serious. Watch the window, watch the window. I'm going down the way. Check the 
Watch your crossfire. Stay troopers. Clear. Press is clear. Step up. Hey trooper. Get the f out of my door. My door. That gun's fully loaded. You try to kill me that, you know? I don't f out like that. Have a seat. Have a seat. You have a right there, mate. Anything you say can be used against you in the court of law. You have a right to retire from the lawyer and have a right to retire from the I know all that bull Just get out of my face then. Then get out of my face or I'm gonna flip the out. I'm gonna bring my car around and put him in the back of the car. Shoot at me, walk the f happy. You all mother I'm not getting f more tickets. Sounds like based on his level of intoxication, he probably didn't know what he was shooting. How drunk is he? He's blitzed. Well take somebody shot at me first. Four hundred miles from the nearest major city on the waterways of western Alaska. Sergeant Ken Acton and Trooper Mike Cresswell must rein in some potentially volatile fishermen. The King Salmon Fisheries just been closed, and some of the native Yupik fishermen won't play by the rules. This is their way of life, and they need that fish to sustain them through the winter. Unfortunately, we have a king salmon population that is decreasing substantially, and that makes closures for subsistence fishing. Troopers expect resistance on the water. So they bring in Trooper Cresswell to lend a second set of eyes and muscle from the sky. Contacting people on the water. It's more dynamic than, than doing a conventional traffic stop on land because everything's moving. You know, you're in a marine environment. I mean, it's a potentially hostile environment. On the river, Acton immediately spots an infraction. Unmarked buoys and fishing closed season. Is this yours? But it is yours? You know, the, the closure started over a half hour ago. If you, if you, somebody told him he would have you. By the way, I'm Ken. Oh, I'm just going to pull it out. We got to take the net and we're going to take um, the fish. I guess. All right, I know. You can't tell me that they don't know it's closed. We've posted it, they've been on PSAs, and frankly, a half hour over the time is just not acceptable. What sucks is we're taking it out of their uh, mouths. This is their food. But just as Cresswell readies for takeoff, an out of control boater almost collides with his plane. Hey, hey! 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 I gotta follow that boat. Unbelievable. He almost center punched me. Hey! Hey! He gives chase. But suddenly the boat turns down a smaller slough, leading to a maze of escape routes. They took off. They're headed down the river right now. The native villager has the home court advantage. I'm pretty much not seeing these guys at all. Finally, Cresswell spots the boat. 
assess, okay, how risky is this, and is it more dangerous to do a pursuit? Time to call for backup. Hello? The guy is BUI. You need to get here. Where Where are these guys at? Oscarville Slough. We're going to try to close up the slough from the bottom end. If you guys want to go in in the top end, we should have a bottle up in there. Okay. I'm going to launch again. To keep an eye on him. I'll talk to you back. With the sun fading, Cresswell hopes Trooper Acton can find them on the water before someone gets killed. We've got a little bit more time here before it gets too dark for us to be doing this on an airplane. Float plane operations at night are notoriously dangerous. This is obviously not a safe situation for the people in that boat right there. Jack Bird's got an intoxicated driver. The water temperature right now is extremely cold. So if they go on the water, we, they're going to have some very serious problems. After chasing the suspects for nearly an hour, their boat suddenly stops. Yeah, it looks like they're maybe, they may have a problem with the boat. Uh, I'm not sure what's going on, but it looks to me like there's somebody in that boat injured. We need to get somebody down here right now. There's somebody laying down in that boat who does not look well. They also just uh, signaled us and waved us. The boat is dead in the water. Um, it's sideways against the swell. I'm going to try to find the trooper boat. Uh, I'm going to try to rendezvous with these guys now. Let's call Acton and tell to come immediately. Uh, what's going on? I'm, I'm in the back slough on the Oscarville. I see you right now. Come straight, you'll see us. The troopers must reach the boat and fast. Okay. Well, how far down? They are just above the outlet of this school. They're not here. They gotta be further down. They were right where we were, just above where we were. Super shallow in here. Yeah, super, super shallow. And what's up with that log when we come yeah, out? Yeah, I see it. Oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. Red log? There's people. Yeah, I know. No one in the boat appears injured. Hold hey. on, guys. Hey, guys. Oh, hey, slow. Come here. Hey, did, you guys, did you guys just come down here? Yeah. Come, in, come over come here. here. Come here. Come here. Go ashore. We need to talk to you. Go to the shore go now. Go to shore. Go to State the shore troopers. now. Go down to shore. State troopers, you go to the shore. You understand? On shore, Cresswell deals with the unpredictable driver. Leave that alone. Whoa. Leave it alone. No, I don't want to no, fight. We, we just got to fight. Huh? You want to fight? We were no, I don't want to fight. Okay, good. You almost ran into that airplane. Did you just not see that? No, I didn't. This is the guy that's driving, that was driving the boat and almost hit uh, Trooper Cresswell's plane earlier. Um, he admitted to drinking. He admitted to driving the boat. So we're doing uh, FSTs right now. Okay, blow, 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 blow. Keep going. Okay. What's it showing? Right now, what it's showing is 249. So you are about three times the legal limit. Okay. So uh, what what's going to happen is uh, I'm going to place you under arrest for operating your boat under the influence. All right. Gee, I gotta go fishing. I understand. 
I stepped in the damn puddle. Put your hands behind your back. Wait. Put your hands me. behind your back. Do it now. First DUI, three days. Whether he gets convicted of a DUI or a BUI, we got him off the river. We might have saved someone's life. East in the Matsu Valley, <laughs> Trooper Storiat is hot on the trail of a fleeing motorcycle. Mega 42. He was doing 145. Uh, Negative. sudden turn takes the chase onto the crowded highway. Come on. And Storia fires his patrol car up to top speeds just to keep up. Holy cow. This is why our cars don't last long. I can smell the brakes already. People just get out of the way and let me go. weren't too far behind them. At these speeds, even the slightest mistake could be deadly. <laughs> but the sergeant orders Storia to stand down for safety, and the cyclist gets away. That sucks. That's the second one I've had on me in two and a half years. There's no good end to that pursuit. That's going to end one of three ways. He crashes, we crash. Least likely of all is that he pulls over. After putting innocent citizens at risk, troopers are determined to get him off the roads. All units 1033, can you find? Do you have a vehicle description now? They comb the valley, keeping an eye out for their wanted man. He's up in front of this car. Nope. I got 45 to 36. 45. I'm trying to catch up to a motorcycle. I think he turned on Vienna Woods, trying to ditch me. Trooper Jared Knoll spots a bike crossing a double yellow line. It might be their suspect. It was a uh, Silver Street bike. He saw me turn around. He ducked into the Woods. I'm 1083. But the suspect quickly vanishes. There was no dust when we got to where it turned to dirt. What are you guys doing back here? You guys see a motorcycle come down this way? Yeah. We're about to... He's hiding in the woods right there. Perfect. Thank you. If there's another unit available, the 1019 is advised the motorcycle hiding in the woods. Now it's decked out. Hey, can you hear me? Can you hear me? With no radio signal for backup, Noel heads into the dark woods alone in search of the possibly dangerous driver. Your backup maybe 30 seconds away, maybe 30 minutes away. You're not going to just sit around and, and wait for backup to show up. You, you've got to get in and handle the situation. Hey, show me your hands. Show me your hands now. Turn around. Why'd you run off, man? Why did I, what? Why'd you run off down here? Hide in the woods. 
You didn't turn all the way down here just to stop and pee. Oh. What's up? Nothing. You're gonna walk back out to your bike. Where's your ID, man? In the bag. In the bag? Okay. Is that your bike? No. Okay, it's not stolen? Registration's right there. Okay, it's not stolen or anything? No. So why'd you duck off down here? You see me turn around on you though on the bridge, right? Um. You Yes, sir. Can I have a seat in my, in my car? Noel checks to see if the driver is their wanted speeder. And CIC 1B45. 10 4. What's the uh, vehicle description? 45. It was blue. Blue in color. He's not their guy, but Noel still has reason to detain him. Could have just been running because he didn't want a ticket, but uh, I'm thinking he he dumped something, drugs or a weapon, some contraband of some sort. Backup units arrived to assist with the search. Just one person on it? Yeah. Caught him out in the woods. About 100, 100 yards in. He said he's on his way down to visit his friend and stopped to take a pee. <laughs> the story doesn't add up. You know, it doesn't make sense to hike 100 yards into the woods off of a dead end road in the middle of nowhere for some privacy. Hey, man. So how much he had to drink tonight? A couple beers. Is that why you didn't stop? No, I didn't see you turn around and then... Uh, Here's the deal with that, man. We're going to stop to take a leak. This is a road out in the middle of nowhere. You're not going to hike 100 yards into the woods for some privacy. They administer field sobriety tests to see if he's drunk. Just go ahead and blow and keep blowing until I tell you stop. Keep blowing. Harder. Okay. What is um. it? You're not enough for a DUI. The search in the woods also comes up empty. It looks like it's this man's lucky day. Here's the deal. If I had turned on those lights, then it, that's a whole other story. But uh, you were passing in a no-passing zone. You're going to get a ticket for that. Sure enough, take care. Mac, I'm 31 to 36. Trooper Abraham Garcia has patrolled the Matsu Valley's urban streets for four years. 10 4. And taken down the toughest criminals. On the ground now! On the ground now! Get on your stomach now! Where's the gun? It's gone! Where is the gun? Is that what you were reaching for? No, no, no. do that. But now, he must prove himself in an entirely different element. Like most troopers, he will serve two years at a remote village post, where wildlife outnumber people. I'm assigned to Cotsby now. I came from the Matsu Valley. It's going to be completely different. Now, more than 500 miles away from his old post, a lot of us would say this is what we signed up for. Garcia must adjust to the harsh realities of rural village life. The weather itself, we came from 50 degree to about 20 degrees, no snow down there to about a foot. The population here is a lot different, smaller. It's about 3,500 people right now. His new partner, Trooper Christopher Bitts, has a lot to teach him about life in the frozen bush. I've been here going on two years. The biggest challenge you face up here is getting from point A to point B and then actually being able to track down and locate people. Like, a lot of times they might not want to be found. So Garcia is brand new, so that's a challenge. Today, they're pursuing a wanted man and must travel 150 miles east to an isolated village on the banks of the Kobuk River. We're getting ready to head out to the village of Shungnak. Go out with Garcia today. We've got a guy with a warrant down there, so see what happens. But Garcia won't have the safety of his patrol car. Flying out. It's my first village trip in Kotzebue. Everything's going to be a kind of a learning experience for me. Transporting prisoners, it's not the same as in the valley. Throw them in the car, put them in the car and take them to jail. Here is, you got to put them in an airplane and fly them out. 
And out here, where nearly everyone is armed, they won't have the luxury of immediate backup. Their only help is Otis Rolls, a village public safety officer who isn't even armed. Thank you, Otis. How are you doing? What I used to have in the Matzo Valley compared to here and what he has compared to where I'm at is just completely different than what I'm used to. It's, it's a big, big eye-opener. Making their job even more dangerous, their arrival isn't much of a surprise. We just landed, and you're hearing it all over the radio, letting everybody else know, hey, the troopers are there. I don't know where you're at at all times. Oh, I know. They waste no time and set out on a rugged 30-minute ride through Alaskan backcountry. The temperature's a bone-chilling 22 degrees, and there's no one in sight if they break down. It's Garcia's first patrol by snow machine at a remote village post, and he'll need to learn fast. Now we're on snowmobiles, don't know what's gonna happen. You get nervous, especially when the weather is changing and it's really cold. It's definitely something that, you know, being in patrol in Palmer, I would have never seen. A half hour later, they arrive in the tiny village of Kobuk and spring into action. Where's this house at? Pretty close. They can only hope their suspect hasn't already been tipped off. This it here, Otis? Yeah. All right, let's roll. Can we go on the back? They split up to cover both exits. Somebody in there now. Who talk to? Are you? you he got a warrant for your arrest. I need to bring you in with me, okay? Five thousand dollar assault three warrant. All right. I guess it's better than in the middle of the work season, huh? You have to talk to a judge about it. I didn't want to put these on in front of your family, but I'm going to put them on up front. Now they must hope their prisoner doesn't try anything on their eight-mile sled ride back to the plane. Might be easier for one of you to sit with your back here and the other one to sit up here. I have to sit right in front of him, making sure he doesn't try to jump off. There's no window. There's no bar separating me and him. There's nothing. It's just me right next to him. We're going to be okay? Yeah. Hope so. All right. Let's roll. There's a storm rolling in. If they don't get back to their plane ASAP, they won't be able to take off. So they take a shortcut. But it dead ends into the river. They must make a tough choice. Cross the semi-frozen waterway and risk falling into ice-laden waters, or find another route and risk missing their plane. Fortunately, they have Otis. Watch out, there's open water over on this one deal. It's real swift. Go in and you're gone. Okay? Stay right behind me, my trail. Okay? Ready? You know, he's got years of experience in this area. It just uh, makes you appreciate the job they do. But it's frightening new terrain for Garcia, the Arctic rookie. A lot of things going through my mind. I mean, he's talking about overflow and possibility of breaking through the ice and going under. And if we do break through the ice, we're pretty much gone. After a nail biting 20 minute ride across the semi frozen river, they make it safely to the other side with their prisoner and board the transport plane back to Kotzebue before the storm. It worked out, got him. We went straight to the house knowing that he was probably gonna hide from us or within minutes of us being there. It is a lot different here. I've seen a part of the state that I never thought I was gonna see. It's awesome, you know, he's flying, jumping in a snowmobile and riding around the village. It's just an experience I would never get anywhere else. At the edge of the continent,
lies one of the most remote law enforcement posts in the nation, Imanic. And it's trooper Bill Connor's job to patrol this almost inaccessible region alone. Everything that you do, you gotta rely on yourself. So you have to change your way of thinking a little bit. It's a lot of lessons learned, sometimes a hard way. <laughs> we definitely get a lot of weapons that come through here. In the last seven days, I've had 17 rifles, shotguns, a machete and a crossbow. These four here are from a felony assault case. I just had two days ago, the uh, suspect had a rifle in his hand and was uh, threatening to shoot one of our VPOs. We've got to try and stay on top of it the best we can. But Connors isn't just outgunned. He's also fighting one of the most dangerous weather events in the remote Alaskan bush, the spring thaw. After months of constant ice and snow, the frozen river begins melting, putting remote villages at the mercy of potentially deadly floods. The pack ice from the Yukon River is starting to break up, and essentially if it breaks up too quick, it creates ice jams. It will start flowing down river, building up, you start getting flooding. Only a few years ago, flooding on the Yukon decimated a small village, resulting in an estimated $5 million in damages. Yeah, this water has definitely come up at least a couple of feet in the last day. There are some ice jams starting to form. We might have some issues. Do you think it's flat? I have to talk to the elders about that. It's so scary. I know. But suddenly, Connor's attention gets pulled away from the village's impending danger. Yeah, what's up, man? Is it cut back? I mean, are you guys bleeding? Thanks. I'll be there in a couple minutes. I just got a phone call from an individual that lives at the end of town here. He wanted to report that there was a stabbing. Looks like three parties were at a residence. Some kind of argument ensued. Our suspect pulled out a knife, started swinging in, and ended up stabbing one guy. It's unknown if he requires any medical treatment. I said no! Come on, let's go. Let's go inside. I, gotta, I, gotta, I know you are, but I know you are. Go inside. Come on, let's just check this out, okay? What happened? Put out a knife and tried to stab me out of my face, and I blocked him. You blocked him, yeah. and then what? And then he went up it. Let me see your hand right here real quick. And that's where he stuck you with it? He tried to stab me on my cheek with that knife. Okay. Get in touch with you guys later. This is only one side of the story. Sometimes, depending on what else is going on, I mean, it might be turned around the other way. Heading to the suspect's residence, the suspect can get a little unpleasant. Last time I was inside the trailer, I was dealing with a guy attempting to cut another guy with a machete. With a potentially crazed suspect and the nearest backup a plane ride away, Connors approaches with extreme caution. There's no one home. Doors were padlocked. They've obviously fled the scene. I spoke with the suspect's father back there. He will find the suspect and bring him over to the office here. Because right now it'll be like looking for a needle in the haystack. Before heading back to post, Connors checks on a more pressing matter, the river. The ice jam has arrived and the water's rising fast. Imanic and its almost 800 citizens are staring down the barrel of an epic flood. If it keeps going this way, it's going to start pushing ice up on the shoreline, which is going to start spilling over and then consuming part of the village. But Trooper Connors must deal with another pressing issue, his open stabbing case. The suspect's been brought in by his father. Come on in. You guys know why you're here, right? I need to sort through the bottom of this because there's some implications uh, and they're not good. We were just working on his Honda and they came over and they were trying to say that we were stealing their bucket. Asked him, will you please go? 
Right. This is my mom's was, land. That's where they start hollering at me. You know, you owe me, you owe me, you owe me. I was like, oh man, I don't owe you nothing. What the hell? Okay, keep going. What else? We tied up the Honda on my sister's Honda and we came up. And that's it? Yeah. We took off. Did you guys get any kind of fight? No. Nothing. There was no fighting. I noticed he was drinking. They were both drinking. There's there's always two sides to every story. The original call that came in, you know, had me kind of concerned. I'm kind of satisfied right now with the answers that I've received. We'll leave it at that for now. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks. See you later. Thanks again. Yeah, no yeah take care. Yeah. Based on the statements they provided and all the way they were handling the interview, I mean, I'm really inclined to believe their side of the story. It just, it wasn't there. After hearing both sides of the story, Connors returns to the rising river's edge, afraid time may be running out for the village. It's business as usual until there is flooding. If that happens, you can, you can have some serious damage. We'll have to evacuate. The river here and the slough is tidally influenced. We're getting close to a high tide right now. Good news. I think it's going down. We actually, we made it right to the top of the bank. It kind of crested right there. You know, it's really hard to say. You just have to take it on a day-to-day -day basis and see what the water level's like. East in the Matsu Valley, the struggle between animals and humans continues. But this time, it's moose. That's way too close for comfort. In Alaska, moose are responsible for more attacks on people than grizzly and black bears combined, making them one of the state's most dangerous animals. The moose are getting pretty agitated with all the extra work that they've had to do to survive through the winter, so they've been charging a lot. We've had a lot of moose come down into the area. A lot of them haven't been able to get enough food because the snowfall's been so heavy this year. 18. 18, go ahead. We got contact advising that there was a moose that's alive, injured, and not able to get up. 10 4, is it in his yard or? It's on the side of the road. 10 4. We're going to go out and see if the moose is just resting, because oftentimes they'll just lay on the side of the road or if it is indeed ill, starving, something like that. I mean, they look like they're big, dumb, slow animals, but definitely not. I mean, those things get up and they're so quick, do some damage to me if, if it gets old. Oh, there it is. Oh yeah, that thing's in bad shape. It may already be dead. Maybe, if she was moving her ears when I was by here an hour ago. Or... Starvation. Poor gal. We'll go over and take a look at her. If this massive 1,200 pound beast charges. Oh, yeah, I think still alive. Cooper would only have seconds to react. walk directly up to the moose and it's not moving or anything like that it's obviously not in the best shape to take care of itself so unfortunately he'll have to go after years of dispatching moose Cooper has developed a ritual to honor the animal I name all of my moose because I want to give them a name before it goes and meets its creator if you will He looks like an Alvin. He's definitely an Alvin. I thought Alvin was a good name. It was just fitting because Alvin's the first letter of alphabet as far as A, so it was the first moves of this month. So 
we won't without it. Our fishing game folks come out, they'll either discard the moose or they'll let nature take its course. Trooper Joseph Hess is in the third hour of his overnight shift. We have troopers from all kinds of different backgrounds, and uh, they all do great work. But, you know, my past military experiences, being around guns and being out in the woods and that kind of stuff obviously helps. I think just being in those stressful situations like you've been in just kind of helps you get used to it. Seventeen, when you get a chance, just confirm 1097 on all. We had a complaint we found a bag of white powdery substance. You didn't know what it was, which could mean a million different things. Then you have that kind of thought in the back of your mind, well, well, what if it is something we just don't want it going in the trash at this guy's house? So we're going to go out and test it, make sure it's not cocaine or anything, and uh, get it off the streets if it is something. It sounds like it's a fairly large amount, so I'm sure there'd be somebody kind of worried about it. Mac, will be 17, 10, 23. In the back of my truck. <laughs> the only reason I stopped it looked like a knife blade or, or stick a handle sticking out, but you never know these days. Yeah. It could be. Yeah, a nice neighbor. Mm-hmm. I'd have brought the bag to you, but I figured if I get an accident on the way over there and this guy got a bag of something in the back of his truck, this isn't good either, so. You can kind of see it's kind of bubbly. Yep. It's not cocaine. Good. Yeah, I don't know, it looks like cake batter or something. Well, even when you squeeze it, it's not like flour, it kind of sticks. Oh, it's, it's yours to, to do whatever you want with. Try baking with it if you want. <laughs> no, I don't <laughs> know. It had a really fresh scent coming out of it. So more than likely it's just some laundry detergent. Uh, I saw the baggie of the white powder, thought it better safe than sorry, and called it in. So it's uh, his now. He can do what he wants with it. Back in Fairbanks. Fairbanks 17. Trooper Melvin Colley receives a chilling call. He's reporting that he was stabbed in the stomach, has no idea where the assailant went, and he is locked in many storage. I got stabbed in his stomach because I have a storage unit. Apparently a storage unit is locked. And he doesn't know where the uh, suspect went. Usually if somebody gets stabbed in the stomach, there's usually a reason why, so there might be more going on. 33, can we confirm that the suspect is, is not there? 33, that's unknown. This is the victim, correct? That's affirmative. 1096 means that he has some type of mental situation going on. So it means that he might be unstable when talking to him. He is responding. FPD is not getting response on the phone anymore. Fairbank 17 confirmed that he's not like being responsive. 17, he's no longer responding to questions on the phone. Media is still on open line, but they can hear somebody in the background on the phone call. Collie rushes to the scene just moments behind Trooper Mulvaney. Let's get this act out right now. They race to the victim's storage unit home, fearing the worst. Can you hear me? So how do we open your door? 33, have fire department come over here with a, with a saw. Come on this side. 
This door has to come open now. You probably have to cut around the metal. I can feel up on it. Yep. Feel up on it. Just feeling this one. We don't know who else is in there, guys. Once it's open, it's not going to He's barely conscious. Yeah, he's coughing up blood. Hey, let's get EMS in here. There's nobody else in there, guys. How you doing? Can you tell us where you hurt? As EMS races to stabilize him, troopers struggle to make sense of the situation. I didn't see anybody on foot. Nothing. We have cameras on the premises too if you need our tape or anything. Okay. Yep. Yeah, can we look at it now? Yeah, I believe so. Let's see if we can. Um, Were you just in here the whole time? Yeah. Did you hear anything? <laughs> These latches, you're supposed to line up the, the holes a certain way in order to put a lock on it. So yeah. somebody, somebody needs to be on the outside of the door in order to do that. But security footage shows no one entering or leaving the unit for several hours. So where all did you get stabbed? Trying to figure out what your injury is. And EMS can't locate any visible injury. Yeah, this coagulated blood. Yeah, it's almost brown on his body. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's been there for a couple of hours. Or there is blood, but we're not sure on, on the validity of his statements. I don't know how he locked himself in there, though. He's got a jerry rope on it. So maybe the rope was tied down so he couldn't get over it. Yeah, we'll, we'll take care of it. He won't be coming back to his home anytime soon inside there was blood everywhere near his head and there was like blood over his hands and on his face we're ready to move it you just stay still okay but it still doesn't add up after talking to the medical staff we learned that there was no stab wounds or anything like that there was no uh, indication of an assault he just had medical conditions that he needed help with he was just coughing up blood blood and he was sick 